comments from Big South Fork National River and Recreation Area. While reading about the history of the park in books such as Folklife Along the Big South Fork of the Cumberland River, one might begin wondering whatever became of some of these historic places. Well, protected within Big South Fork is Cherit Creek Lodge, dating back to the early 19th century, which still stands as a lasting reminder of a way of life that was once widespread in the region. We hope to see you at the park soon. Wow, we are chapter 49, I <laughs> learned something. So thank you everyone for joining the Humanities Tennessee and the Southern Festival of Books 2020. I'm so glad the Tennessee Humanities brought us, even if it's virtual, uh, I'm so excited for the invitation to host this session and to get to meet Jaquira Diaz and talk about her first uh, book ever and we hope not the first one because we know Ordinary Girls, it's already uh, a book that is making a lot of noise for the extraordinary story that Jaquita has shared with us. So before we get to our conversation with Jaquita, I wanna thank on behalf of Humanities Tennessee, the sponsors that make this festival possible, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Tennessee Arts Commission, Ingram Content Group, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books, the official bookseller, where we hope that during this session or after this session, you go and buy Ordinary Girls and many other books and make sure that you support your local independent bookstores. Um, a little note about your participation, of course, for Jaquira. Uh, this is most engaging when she hears from people participating in the conversation. And so we want to make sure that you get to ask your questions to her through the chat. To do that, you're going to have to do that through the Facebook Live, or if you go to Humanities Tennessee website, you can also connect to the uh, Attendify, which is the app that we are using for the Festival of Books. So remember, Facebook Live or through the website with uh, Humanities Tennessee. Jaquira wants to hear from you, not only more questions, so please chat with us. But I am ready with some questions for her, for sure. And I want to make sure that um, we leave at least 15 minutes for questions from whomever is joining us, hopefully from Nashville, but many parts. Um, so Jaquira Diaz was born in Puerto Rico and then moved to Miami. Um, she lives here and there, both physically and emotionally in many ways. And that's why I connected in so many ways to her story but also uh, in the so many ways in which she expanded my own notion of living in the hyphen, in, in living uh, in so many worlds that she occupies. Um, if I tell you much about her, I would be, you know, talking about her book and we want her to tell us about that. But um, I do want to share that we are very pleased that Jaquira is with us sharing her first book and memoir. And, um, as, as someone who is always looking for stories that um, give voice to those that we have not seen that much, it is really great um, not only to connect with her voice in the places that she takes us, the music that she shares, uh, the anguish and the sadness and the violence, but also uh, this very great capacity that human beings have to like still achieve um, all so many um, overcome so much. And I think that that's why uh, Jaquita's book connected uh, in this moment with me in so many ways. So before we start with questions, Jaquita is going to read from her book a little bit and then we will start the discussion. Jaquita. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Renata. Um, I also want to thank everyone who made this event possible. Um, I wish that we could all be there in person, but I'm also grateful that we get to have this space and this moment to connect. I'm, I'm calling in from the United Kingdom, which is very, very far away, and it's 11.36 p.m. right now. So I feel uh, I'm exhausted, but also in a good way, in a good way, um, very happy to be, that I get to do this, very, feeling very lucky that I get to do this. Um, so I'm going to be reading from Ordinary Girls, um, which is from a chapter called Candy Girl, which is very close to the middle. It's during my teenage years, um, and it's in first person plural. I won't tell you too much, but it's really um, a chapter that kind of gives, gives an overview of what's happening in my life, and it should kind of give you an overall feeling of some of what the book is about. Um, and it's just a very short excerpt. Candy Girl. That's how it was with us, how it was supposed to be. We kept each other's secrets, wiped each other's tears, protected each other. We passed notes during class. We told each other everything, our fantasies and our crushes, the latest arguments with our parents, the TLC concert we'd been saving up for, the guy who confessed his love while we rode the bus together on a Friday after school. We sat together in the cafeteria, found each other in the hallways. We harmonized to shies if I ever fall in love or en vogue's hold on while we waited for the bell to ring. We went on missions together, cutting class and catching the bus to the mall or the flea market or the beach, singing Whitney in the back of the bus. We snuck out to salsa music festivals at Bayfront Park on the weekends, turning each other to Andy Montañez's Casi Te Envidio and Frankie Ruiz Mi Libertad until the park closed. We went to birthday parties at Hot Wheels where we strapped on rented roller skates and cruised around La Pista with the disco lights, shaking it to two live crew. We wore short shorts and crop tops, baggy jeans and basketball jerseys, big hoop earrings. And no matter what, everybody had opinions about how we dressed, called us tomboys or hood rats or fast girls. Our shorts were too short, our jeans too tight, too baggy, our voices too loud. Everybody wanted to control what we wore, what we did, who we did it with. We were not the girls they wanted us to be. We were not allowed to talk like this, to want like this. We're not supposed to feel the kind of desire you feel at 13, at 14. What kind of girl? they love to say, what kind of girl? Even as they took what we gave, took what we tried to hold on to, our voices, our bodies. We were trying to live, but the world was doing its best to kill us. And I'll stop there. So, you know, for our audience, uh, Jaquita has told me that she wanted to read a little bit, but I did not know what she was gonna read from, and I think my first question is actually very fitting. Um, I, I wanted to talk about what's in a title. And of course, this is a, a memoir. So it could have been The Ordinary Girl, and it, may, it might have been an even more predictable title. But this is about you. It's about your single story. Um, but I gathered that by not choosing Ordinary Girl and centering in you, uh, The Pearl Girls actually centers the story on this group of women. Uh, that shape you, um, that that really form who you are. So for those who have not read the book, can you tell us a little bit more about those girls in this book? Uh, yes. So um, start starting with me, I was a, a kid who was lost. I was a high school dropout, a juvenile delinquent, was growing up with a mother who suffered from mental illness and addiction. And I suffered from my own mental illness and was really struggling. And I was angry um, and I kept getting into fights. And so one of the reasons why I, I use a lot of the first person plural and talk about the we is because I had this group of girls 
who were my friends, who were, some of them were very much like me, who, you know, lived in one parent households. And some of them lived what I consider to be very normal lives with two parents. And we went to public school. Um, we were black and brown and most of us from working class backgrounds. Some of us lived in poverty. And what I wanted to to write was a book that was not just my personal story, but that was very much about navigating a specific kind of black and brown girlhood in the Miami of the 80s and 90s. Um, but I also wanted to speak to something larger, something that is not just about me, not just about us, but that really speaks to girlhood in general. Um, that is doing you know the work of the personal and the universal that is really speaking about navigating a certain kind of girlhood and so these girls um in a lot of ways saved me because they rescued me again and again um i do talk a, a little bit about the about them in the book about how they brought me food when i was starving they you, kept me out of trouble they picked me up you know when when I tried to get out of an abusive relationship. It was really these girls who saved me again and again. And part of what I wanted this book to be was kind of a love letter to to my girls, to you know, to this friendship that endured for so many years. Um, some of them, two of them, didn't make it and didn't live to see this book. And they're also part of the reason why I wanted to write this. Hmm. That's beautiful. When when did you start writing this memoir? And I think I read somewhere that it may have started as a novel, as fiction. Um, I, it actually started as a memoir. It started as very short essays. And in the process of writing it, I decided I can't write a memoir. I'm just going to write a novel. And I stopped I stopped writing a memoir and I decided to turn it into a novel. And I, I, was, I wrote this kind of weird, strange version that was an autobiographical novel and stopped because that, it was pretty awful. And went back and struggled with it for a very long time. It took about 12 years to write this book. Um, wow. But in the end, I, I realized that it was, it couldn't be a chronological or strictly chronological memoir, um, that it needed to be chronological in some sense, but also to have chapters that were about relationships or that were arranged um, thematically that weren't just chronological. Because when I tried to arrange the book like a novel or just like a very chronological story, it felt like I was fabricating this strange sense of chronology or a strange resolution. It didn't, it felt like lying. Um, so I had to, I had to keep going back and revising it and changing it so that it could feel like I was telling the truth, not just, you know, my own personal story, but also speaking to something larger and focusing and refocusing on larger themes than just my life. Well, it seems one of my questions or comments was around that, like it seemed the nonlinear way in which you tell the story. And I wonder, I, I thought that that might have been also on purpose, not, 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 not only because it was not the natural thing to do during it otherwise, but also is this locating us and disorienting us in that back and forth from place to place from time to time is, is it is also part of what your story is. Yeah, um, it there were certainly moments when I, I really wanted a sense of dislocation um, and a sense of what it is to feel like you're living a very chaotic life. Um, particularly in a chapter called Girls Monsters, when there's a lot of violence and chaos. I, I really wanted readers to feel like this is a, a chapter where you're supposed to feel a sense of things happening too fast and moving along too quickly and in a way that feels like there's there's a momentum but it also feels like you're you're gonna hit something like you're moving so fast like you're gonna crash into something um so it felt like there were definitely places in the book where i where i needed a sense of dislocation mm. so i have to say that when i came to the us um i i felt that everybody thought that they needed to write a memoir i mean you could find memoirs by like anybody, right? And and I, I, I come to this genre 
precisely because people like you rescue what it's supposed to be. And and I know that for some, it can self sort of uh, a purpose of self exploration, right? Like organizing meaning, connecting that sort of who you are, what made you who you are, what brought you to become. But it seems to me that your memoir in particular has n it's not self serving and is is um it's a it's a story that is in the service of others. And just like there's a lot of the girls that you just described. I feel that also there are girls out there for whom you are writing this story. Absolutely. Um, that, I think that's the reason I write. I, I was a, a reader before I was a writer. And um, I, as a kid, I was a kid who loved to read and never found myself in books. And I looked for books about people like me. I mean, I was a girl, a closeted queer girl growing up in poverty and in a working class, you know, community where everybody was black and brown and bilingual Latino immigrants and um, a lot of people from the Caribbean. It really felt like a very different place than, you know, the places I found in books. And I didn't find books about people like me who lived in neighborhoods like mine. And I, I'd love to read and I would go to the library and ask the librarian to recommend books. And ev almost every single book they gave me was written by a white man and it was about white men. And I thought that to be a writer, you had to be a white man, um, that only white men got to publish books. Um, and I mean, it wasn't until I read Esmeralda Santiago's when I was Puerto Rican, when I was, I think, 18, 19 years old, that I thought, oh, we exist in American literature. There are books about people like us. Um, and it was it it felt like her book gave me permission to write just, you know, about a life, about what it is to grow up Puerto Rican, working class, but also to write about the kind of people I knew, grandmothers who, you know, like mine, um, mothers like mine, to write about things that are intimate and uh, about community and a sense of community and the way that that feels for, for me or for someone like me. And um, when I started writing this book, it felt very much like I was writing for that girl I was who loved to read but didn't find herself in books. And it, it also became very clear that because I was writing about my community that I didn't just want to write about them but I wanted to write for them um, and it felt like I was writing this book for us. Mm. Well since you mentioned your grandmothers I want to go uh, there. You, you talk about your maternal grandmother Mercy um, who shave off your bad hair yeah and your paternal abuela who is who teaches you to to love your blackness. Um, can you tell us about your abuelitas and in them, um, I guess the anti-blackness, colorism, racism within Latinx communities and families. And I actually wanna read a little bit, just from a little bit of what you said in the book on page 18, you say, I was brown, brown, brown like tierra. But even though we had a white mother, abuela reminded us that we were a black family and that every single one of her grandchildren was black, no matter how light-skinned we might look to the world. Then you also say later, like most black people in the US, the Caribbean and Latin America, our histories, our cultures, our people were stolen. In this moment, I don't think that there's more uh, important time when many, I hope that many Latino families and communities and organizations are speaking openly about anti-blackness within our community. I hope so too. Um, one of the things that I wanted this book to be is very honest um, about the kind of racism and colorism that exists in Latino communities, including Puerto Rican communities, including Puerto Rico. Um, and in the diaspora. And I grew up, um, I'm black, biracial. My father is black, my mother is white. They're both Puerto Rican. And um, 
my black grandmother was really the one who raised us when my father was not really around and my mother couldn't because she was suffering from mental illness. But my mother's mother, Mercy, who was a white woman, um, was very violently racist, even against her own grandchildren, and never really let us forget it. She was very vocal with her racism and um, said the kind of things that could scar a child to, to me, to my brother, to my sister, to my cousins who are also black. And we grew up kind of always feeling like we were not part of her white family. Um, like we were the bastard grandchildren, except my brother who she loved to claim because he was blonde and blue eyed um, and looked like her. And my mother, because she suffered from mental illness, didn't really know how to raise black children, didn't really know how to protect us, except that to my mother, she was like this, she wanted to be this colorblind person who just said, I love you. I, you know, you should love your body. You're beautiful. And always told us we were beautiful. But my mother never, ever affirmed our blackness. That was our abuela. She was black, unapologetically so, and did not conform to white people's standards of beauty and was very clear that we were a black family and was very clear that if people saw us walking down the street, they would see a black family and that we should know that. Um, but also, I mean, it's, it's not something, for me, I also felt like I was kind of like an alien because I didn't look like my abuela or like my father's family. And I didn't look like anybody in my mother's family. I looked like my little sister. She looked like me and that was it. And we didn't look like anyone else in our families. And so it was re really strange to grow up seeing, you know, not looking like anybody, none of the people you love, like every single person in our families look, were, was different from us. Um, and so it was painful and difficult to have you know, your own grandmother, your white grandmother tell you that you're not part of her family or, and to, you know, explicitly and explicitly, implicitly and explicitly always um, blame, blaming our black family for things that went wrong, um, making up terrible stories. Um, and I wrote about some of that in the book. Um, I also wrote about part of the history of Puerto Rico, which included, I mean, colonialism and um, slavery and how in our family, we don't really know a lot about our black family because of slavery. I can trace my mother's white family um, back to Spain and we can't do the same with our black family. Um, a little bit of what I write about is some of the history of the marginalization of Puerto Rico's um, people who were fighting for independence and um, I wish that I could actually, you know, talk about the history of our family and trace our family back, but we were never able to. Uh, it's something that I do think is not necessarily talked about enough is colorism in, in Latinx communities, including Puerto Rico. I think, I think for the most part, a lot of people would like to pretend that it's not real. Um, including Puerto Ricans, including people in my own family would like to pretend that racism and colorism doesn't exist. Um, but racism and colorism is real. It exists in all over the Caribbean, all over the US, all over the world. And, um, it, and it's not just, you know, the kind of violent, outspoken racism that my grandmother showed. It's also systemic and systematic. Um, it's also in every single system in place in education, in healthcare, in criminal justice, in in every system um, that is now in place in Puerto Rico and the United States. I, so, we could talk about this forever. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do too, and I think that's not the only, but I I I think that that's uh, why your book is such an important gift to us in this moment in time. And um, I certainly will use it as a tool of conversation with my Latinx circles and communities, because I think that you have given us a great 
um, story to dig and confront and challenge and 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 really um, do the work that we have been avoiding as a as a community for centuries. So thank you. So speaking of that, it seems that the theme of belonging, not only your sense of belonging racially, where who are you and right like one grandma sending you one way, the other one uh, uplifting you in other ways. So, but the, the sense of belonging racially, but also of course, in terms of place, you're in Puerto Rico, you're in Miami. Can you can you share a little bit uh, of, of like where, where you arrive about this sense of belonging? Where is home for you? Do you, <laughs> how do you decide where home is? What makes home? Oh my goodness. Right. <laughs> where right. is home? Um, where is home? That is a very difficult question for me to address because I always feel that Puerto Rico is home for me. I go back a lot and I feel like my most genuine self when I'm there. Um, but I also don't necessarily feel like I can be 100% open with my sexuality while I'm there. Um, especially in the last i want to say 3 to 4 years where there have there has been so much violence against people in the lgbtq community um my partner is trans i am a gay woman and i don't necessarily feel like i can be 100% myself there um i also love miami and miami also feels like home um but there's i i, I have the same sense that i can't be 100% myself there i my partner and I have experienced a lot of homophobia while there. Um, and there's also, um, a, Miami is also very, I want to say, um, strange place at times um, because it's always changing. There's a lot of, there are a lot of transient communities. Um, you know, my Miami no longer exists. You know, Miami Beach is gentrified it's changed so much. So I don't necessarily feel like I have a complete sense of that being my home. And I spent half the year before the pandemic, I spent half the year in Montreal, which is where my partner was living at the time. And then now I'm in the UK <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for, for about six months. <laughs> so where is home? I guess for me, to be quite honest, home is not a place, but a person. Um, I'm with my partner, my spouse now. We just got married in August. Oh, congrats. And thank you. So home is not a place, but a person. So wherever Lars, my partner, is is home. And um, we'll, I guess we're going to do a lot of traveling in the next four years. <laughs> yes, that's beautiful. Um, so let's, my last question, and then I know there are already questions coming through Facebook Live. Um, so... There's, of course, so much in your book, but there's a lot of trauma, of course, violence in your story. Um, but I also love how you give agency to the, to even in those places, there's a part, I'm, a, I'm out of order now, but where you talk about um, the communities where you are, where you learned violence, but it is also where you learned the sense of community. I think you were talking about your um the place where you grew up in Puerto Rico. But one thing that I I, I shared with some of uh, leaders of color, especially women of color and especially black women is this tension with our own stories. Um, almost one in one hand, we are expected to have a, a story of trauma. And often it feels that is that story of trauma or overcoming it that is the currency for credibility or for legitimacy for or our voice and our power. And um, and that sometimes we want to be seen for more than that. It's not that that's not important, that's not who we are, but that's not all we are. And I was thinking of this because uh, a local uh, activist in Nashville, and I'm going to name her because she put this on Twitter. This is not like a private message. Tequila Johnson, who's the co-founder of a civil rights organization voting for our uh, right to vote and make sure that Black people in particular um, are protected. She said, because I never want my trauma to be the driving force behind my activism. I want my restoration and healing to be what people see when they see my work. If I base my work off of trauma, it would always need 
that to survive. My work is based off my dream for this nation. My work is based off of what I want, not what I don't want. I'm fighting for something, the Black American dream, my life, not just fighting against something. So I wanted to ask you um, how you respond to someone from like Tequila who um, has this tension about like our stories, of course, shape us. And it's, it's, it's actually what, what gives us credibility to fight for Black people in her case, right? But, but it is also sometimes the only part that people see in us. And yet here, your book, you are saying, see it. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely see it and speak it. One of the reasons why I decided to write something about trauma is because my whole life, I was told to shut up about it. Um, and women of color, Latinas, black women, um, we, we, are, we have been historically erased and silenced and our stories have been erased. And especially when they are about trauma and about sexual violence, we are often made to feel like we can't talk about it. And I wanted to change that in my own narrative. I wanted to, to be able to say, this happened and a lot of other things happened and I go on. But, but more importantly, um, in addition to, to speaking after so many years of not being allowed to speak, I wanted to make something meaningful and artful with the, you know, my personal story. I wanted to write something that was meaningful, not just to me, but to other women and to other girls. Um, so that they could actually see that they can speak, that they can do something meaningful and artful with their lives, that they don't have to be silent, um, and that there's no shame in speaking about your trauma. The shame is not mine. <laughs> the shame is someone else's. I, I mean, I do agree with Tequila. I also feel like, for me, a lot of people expected this book in the end to to speak more about the process of healing and about resilience. And they wanted, I guess, um, this to end up being a narrative about resilience. And I, I really wanted to avoid that because um, in the end, I'm still living it. I'm still living my life and it hasn't ended. And I didn't want this to focus on how I got better or how I overcame things. Um, I think the narrative of resilience really avoids talking about the real issues with which which are systemic issues. I think I would much rather um, tell a story that resonates with my readers, with women and girls, with other people who have experienced sexual violence, other people who have lived through trauma, or people who haven't necessarily lived it, but a story that also resonates with them, um, and open open up the world for conversations. Um, I don't really consider myself an activist. I consider myself a writer and an artist. Um, and the work I do, I find is, is different. So that's, a, that's, that's very profound what you said about seeing um, the narrative of resilience as actually avoiding the work of confronting the systemic issues that make that trauma even possible in the first place. Thank you. So we do have a question that actually relates to this conversation we're in. Uh, Sue from Facebook asks, she says, this sounds very brave to write this book. How did you find the courage to write it? And thank you for doing so. Thank you. Um, I don't really consider myself brave. I don't think I needed courage to write it. Um, I think when I think of what I do, the writing. I think of myself as an artist um, and I would be a writer no matter what. It, this really for me felt like a story, a book that I needed to write before I could write anything else. I felt like I needed to get this out of the way um, because there was something inside of me that was that was like screaming to get the story out. Um, but I feel like no matter what I try to write, I wrote four other books in the process of writing this one that never saw the light of day. Um, no matter what I tried to write, I kept returning to this story and to a lot of the things that happened in this book. I kept writing short stories about mothers with addiction and mental illness. And it, and it felt like I was just avoiding it. I needed to write this book. 
Hmm. Well, I think our our viewers are really in sync with um, our conversation here. I love it. Karen asks, um, can you talk a little bit about how you went about getting this memoir published? I believe you have written something that women and girls need to read. Thank you. Um, so I, I was first started writing um, this in very short essays. Um, when it, the the very first draft of this that was con that I considered a memoir was written in very short chapters that were kind of like vignettes that went one after the other chronologically, um, and like I said, it took about twelve years to write. But to get it published, um, I got an agent. Uh, we met at the Sawani Writers Conference. She heard me read there. And she reached out to me, Michelle Brower, she reached out to me and said, do you have any work that you can send me? And I had another agent at the time. Um, and unfortunately that relationship didn't work out. But then about three years later, I sent some pages to Michelle, about 25 pages. And she read them, we talked on the phone, she offered me representation. And then she asked me to see what I had of the memoir. And I sent her, I wanna say like 150 pages or so. And she gave me some notes. I revised. Then she gave me more notes. I revised again until I had a, a whole book. Um, and when it was ready, when it was polished and ready, she sent it out to a group of editors. And we heard back from Algonquin Books, I want to say within a few days, um, that they wanted to publish it. And then they published it about a, a year and a half later. Um, and I mean, it wasn't that easy. I also had to keep revising it um, three, four, four more times um, before it saw the light of day. Well, and you said at the beginning, it took you how many years? 12, 12 years, 12 years from beginning to end. Perseverance, wow. Um, what is, I, music is very important in the book. There's music everywhere. I, I, um, it places us in a moment in time, but also sometimes we know we're in Puerto Rico or we're in Miami. Uh, can you talk about the importance of music to to your story? And I was wondering, is there a playlist already that I can <laughs> the ordinary girls playlist or should I just build it on my own? Um, I, I'm, I need to put that together because a bunch of people have asked me for the ordinary girls playlist and I haven't. I'm, I keep meaning to get around to it and I haven't. Um, I will put one together and share it with everyone on Twitter one day in the next few days. <laughs> um, music for me is very, very important. I was, I, when I was a kid, I studied music and I had this dream that I was gonna be, make music um, and go on the road. And so I played the piano and I played the bass and then um, I stopped playing and now I just write about music, but um, part of, part of the reason why music was so important to me is because I write in, in a lot of ways in, I write to music, but also I write kind of like a composer writes music, um, looking at a sentence as the unit of composition. And I, I, when I'm writing sentences, I'm listening to how they sound. I write them out and I read them out loud. I record myself reading them and I listen to how a sentence sounds. And I do this again and again until I have a paragraph and then I record it and I listen to it and I keep doing this. I This is how I wrote my book, which is, I don't recommend it, don't do this. <laughs> but, but one of the things that's very, very important to me, in addition to all the subtext and the story and metaphor and setting and all those things, it's how prose sounds. And I want it to sound like it, it's meant to be read aloud. And part of this is because, I mean, I'm Puerto Rican. I come from a culture where we are storytellers. We tell stories out loud. And everyone in my family told stories. And I wanted the book to read in a lot of ways, like, it's a story meant to be told out loud. Um, music for me, it shaped me, it still does. It puts me in a very particular time and place, but it also says a lot about 
you know, my history. Um, and so every time I bring up a song, I want the reader not just to, to think about that time and place, but to think about the subtext and what a song is saying. There's a certain irony to being a woman who considers herself a feminist, but is listening to very violent song lyrics. And there's a certain, I think, sadness in a story when I'm thinking about what it is to be a girl but listening to music that is very violent against girls. And I didn't really think about it at the time when I was listening to it, because I was a teenager and you know had no clue. But looking back and writing about those moments and going back and listening to all the music I was listening to, I realized that there was so much violence in our everyday life that we just ignored, that we didn't even think about, that we just learned to live with everything surrounding us, everything around us was full of violence. Um, and I wanted the music to do some of that work too, to not just create a, you know, put a reader in a time and place, but to put a reader in a mindset, the mindset of a, of a teenage girl who is growing up and having all these, you know, all this violence in so many different ways coming at her um, everywhere she looked, everywhere she was. So uh, we probably have time for just one more question. And I was wondering, you know, when you say that um, part of how you build the story and, and um, focusing on the story and not on the, um, actually how you overcame or the resolution or the redemptive sort of ending. Um, you know, I was thinking you learn from your father, the love for books and words and reading and writing. Um, we learn from your grandmother, your love for yourself and your identity and so many other people in the book that taught you so many things. What do, what do you hope we learn from you? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I hope, I would hope that, that one of the things that readers take away is um, in the very last pages of the book, which is, that love actually can save us in some ways, that those relationships that are just, you know, with ordinary people in our lives, our friends, our family, those are the things that save us. And that sometimes we don't really necessarily know or, or know that they're the things that will save us or that they're there, but that they're so, so important. Um, in the time when I was during the time when I was a kid and I was, you know, living in chaos and, you know, in a lot of ways throwing my life away, I never once stopped to look around and say, these people love me. Um, and now I do that all the time. So I hope that something that you all take away is to look around and see the people that love you and love them back. That's beautiful. So I'm going to end reading uh, something that actually is from your introduction in girlhood. Um, your last sentence says, we are, one, we are women now, those of us who are alive, those who made it. For a while there, we didn't know if any of us would. I know that everybody that reads the book will know that we're so glad you did. And that um, not only that you did, but that, but that you're sharing that journey with us and and um, your message of recognizing those that have loved us and have brought us to to where we are and recognizing all that they have given us. So thank you so much. I can't wait to share the book with many other people. I don't know if you have any final departing points. I know it's late for you in England, but if there's any final message before we take off, please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. And thank you, everybody, for coming and for your questions. I appreciate it. Well, so here's a reminder, Ordinary Girls by Jaquira Diaz. Go ahead and you can order online through uh, your independent bookstore. But we hope that you buy it through Parnassus Books in Nashville, which is one of the sponsoring organizations that make this festival free for all of us. And while you're at it, please make sure that you also consider donating to Humanities Tennessee. So I just want to end by thanking the team of Humanities Tennessee who are behind the screen, pulling this off. I know it's hard, but we're so grateful that you brought us together. And uh, we hope next year is live and maybe Jaquita can come to Nashville. 
But we are so grateful, Jaquita, that you join us. It's so late on the other side of the world, but um, I can imagine a better way to end this week. And thank you so much for sharing your ordinary girls with all of us. Thank you so much, Renata. I appreciate it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.